Hello all. Um, I am Fadila Shaib speaking to you from WHO headquarters in Geneva and welcoming you to our global 19 press conference today, Friday, 15 January. We will update you about COVID-19, but also about the recommendation of the sixth emergency committee meeting regarding the outbreak of COVID-19 that took place uh, virtually yesterday. The emergency committee statement and a press release were sent to the media an hour ago and are also posted on the WHO website. I will let uh, Dr. Tedros introduce our guest, the chair of the emergency committee um, uh, later on. Present in the room are Dr. Uh, Tedros, Director General of WHO, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director Health Emergencies, Dr. Maria von Kerkhoff, Technical Lead for COVID-19, Joining also are Dr. Jawad Mahjour, Assistant Director General Emergency Preparedness, and Dr. Kerman Dolea, Unit Head, International Health Regulation. Both can uh, talk about the Emergency Committee recommendation. We have also Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General Access to Medicine and Health Products. Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, Dr. Bruce Elward, Special Advisor to the Director General and Lead on ACT Accelerator. Joining um, online is Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals. Uh, welcome all. Simultaneous interpretation is provided in the six UN languages plus Portuguese and Hindi. Now, without further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Fadila. Shukran. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. The Emergency Committee met this week and made a series of recommendations about the COVID-19 outbreak. It will come as no surprise to you that variants and vaccines were heavily discussed as well as the current epidemiological situation. Some countries in Europe, Africa and the Americas are seeing spikes in cases with multiple factors driving transmission risk. This is because we are collectively not succeeding at breaking the chains of transmission at the community level or within households. We need to close the gap between intent and implementation at the country and individual level because at present there is immense pressure on hospitals and health workers. With almost 2 million deaths and new variants appearing in multiple countries, the Emergency Committee emphasized the need for governments to do all they can to curb infections through tried and tested public health measures. The more the virus is suppressed, the less opportunity it has to mutate. We need to be more efficient than the virus and reach excellence in everything we do. There is only one way out of this storm, and that's to share the tools we have and commit to use them together. The committee called for upgrading national sequencing capacity so that as the virus changes, we can effectively monitor and respond to new challenges. This is a defining moment in the pandemic, and I was pleased that the emergency committee put a major emphasis on rolling out COVID-19 vaccines equitably. Health workers are exhausted. Health systems are stretched and we are seeing supplies of oxygen run dangerously low in some countries. Now is the time we must pull together as common humanity and roll out vaccines to health workers and those at highest risk. This is key to saving lives, protecting health systems and driving a fair recovery. We have also developed updated guidance about how to best protect people in long-term care facilities and recognize that if they are isolated, it has a profoundly negative impact physically and mentally. The guidance aims to prevent the COVID-19 virus from entering the facilities 
and ensure our loved ones remain safe. I was really pleased to see refugees in Jordan start to be vaccinated this week. I truly appreciate the approach taken by the Jordanian government to ensure that refugees are not left behind. It's critical this momentum on equitable vaccine rollout continues in the weeks ahead. I came into public health because I wanted to ensure that everyone everywhere has access to quality health services. I know what it's like to come from a continent where not all health services are available. When AIDS drugs first rolled out, they were only available in rich countries until a historic movement of health advocates, civil society and manufacturers provided a rollout of low-cost antiretroviral drugs. In the H1N1 pandemic, by the time low-income countries received vaccine supply, the pandemic was over. We don't want this to be repeated. COVID-19 vaccines are a major scientific breakthrough, and I know through COVAX that we will distribute them a lot more effectively than in the past. We're working hard, but we must also do more to ensure that vaccines reach those that need them most. I will keep repeating this over and over again during the coming weeks, because, as I said on Monday, I want to see vaccination underway in every country in the next 100 days so that health workers and those at, at high risk are protected first. I'm looking forward to the executive board next week and working with manufacturers and countries to ensure that vaccine supply is available and distributed equitably around the world. I now want to turn to the chair of the emergency committee, Professor Didier Hussain, to discuss the recommendations from the committee. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to you all. The emergency committee met um, yesterday, and I want to thank first the members of the committee for their work and contribution to these uh, recommendations. It's a sad anniversary because uh, one, nearly one year ago, uh, the emergency committee recommended and was followed uh, in considering that the EVA considered the public health emergency of international concern. Since that time, as Dr. Tedros said, 90 million people contaminated, nearly 2 million people uh, died. And uh, the committee focused on two things. The first is, first is a worry, a wor worry about the, the variant which starts circulating in some places in the world. This variant uh, requires a strong and quick effort in research, in collaboration between research teams, in sharing of information as suggested and mentioned by Dr. Tedros, and uh, also about the data sharing. I think uh, we are in a race between the virus, who is going to continue trying to mutate in order to spread more easily, and uh, the humanity which has to try to stop this uh, spreading. And uh, this effort of research needs to be very, very quick and very intense. Uh, fortunately, there is also a good news. Good news is about the vaccine. but. Uh, this good news should not be transformed in bad news. And uh, we should remember that the objective for 2021 is 20% of the population vaccinated, not only in rich countries, but also in low and middle income countries. And it's extremely important not to transform this good news into a bad news. So, and for the vaccine, of course, some of the recommendations of the emergency committee are about trying to know more about the efficacy of the vaccine, the efficacy against the new variants, 
etc. I will not go into the detail. I would like to add a final point about the situation in which the world is presently. Uh, we are a little bit paralyzed, we are a little bit confused, and clearly the question of travel inside the world, around the world, by air, by, by, by road, by sea, needs to be a better, perhaps, uh, possible and organized. And this is why one of the recommendations of the committee to WHO was to take a strong lead in order to produce a very a clear guidance and scientifically based guidance about how best to uh, facilitate and permit uh, the circulation uh, of people in, in a safe manner uh, by air, by sea, and by... Uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. These recommendations are very important as the world fights COVID-19. The greater the solidarity we have, the more lives we will save and the quicker we will end this pandemic. Thank you so much again, Professor. I thank you and back to you, um, Fadila. Thank you, DG. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Usain. I would like now to open the floor to questions from journalists. I remind you that you need to raise your hand under the raise your hand icon in order to get in the queue. I would like to start uh, with Christophe Vogt from Agence France Presse. Christophe, can you hear me? Christophe? Can you please unmute yourself, Christophe? We cannot hear you. Okay, that should be done now. Can you hear me now? Uh, very well. Go ahead, please, Christophe. Okay, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I had a, I'm, I'm having a question about what uh, Dr. Hussain just said and, uh, and, and what has been said in the last few weeks when the white vaccines arrived and uh, with the variants. Um, it's a bit confusing. We had the uh, light at the end of the tunnel, at the end of the year, and then um, two or three days ago, Dr. Ryan, uh, talked about uh, how this year could be even worse than, than last year was. And uh, so how can we reconcile the fact that now we have efficient vaccines and still um, this idea that things could get still worse? Uh, Dr. Okay. Ryan will start. No, uh, 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 thanks for your question. Uh, I think this is a matter of deciding the future. We, we, we have an element of control on the future we want to have. We have, uh, and we did uh, also warn uh, in uh, 2020 that if we were to rely entirely on vaccines as the only solution, we could lose the very control measures that we had at our disposal at the time. And I think to some extent that has come true for different reasons, because people are more inside in the Northern Hemisphere because the holiday season uh, pushed and brought people together and people mixed in a way that they might not otherwise have done. <clears throat> uh, we've seen uh, northern and southern hemisphere increases. It's not just in the northern hemisphere. If you go to the southern cone of, of the Americas, in, in, in Argentina, in Chile, in, in Paraguay, in Uruguay, and in, in Brazil, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing difficulties there. This phenomenon of a rapid acceleration of cases is in the Americas, it is in Europe, it is in, in some countries in Africa, and if, uh, it is uh, in some countries in every region. Um, <clears throat> so that is the reality. And that's happening for a reason. Uh, and a small proportion of that may be due to the emergence of uh, variants that are fitter. But the large proportion of that transmission has occurred because we are reducing our social physical distancing. Our behavior is, as the DG said in his speech, we're not breaking the chains of transmission. The virus is exploiting our lack of tactical uh, commitment, our fatigue, uh, the breaking down of our behaviors. Uh, the vaccine is light at the end of the tunnel. It is a hugely, um, uh, it's a massive advance, but it doesn't answer and it won't address every question that we have. We have to continue doing the other measures. And even with that, and Bruce will speak to this, if vaccination is going to be successful, 
people have got to get vaccinated. And for people to get vaccinated, countries have to get vaccine. Uh, and therefore, it's not just an equity issue about countries getting vaccine. It's about protecting those around the world who are most vulnerable, our frontline workers. So uh, we want to start the year on a hopeful note. I think what the Director General is trying to do is start the year on a realistic note. We need to be real with ourselves. We need to be honest. We're not doing as well as we could. Um, we've learned so much about the, the virus. We know more than we've ever known before. We have more tools. We have to sustain the effort. It's tough. We've got to pick ourselves back up. Many of us in the Northern Hemisphere in the New Year where people have been celebrating holidays. Uh, many people in the Southern Hemisphere similarly, uh, they're confused because they think, oh, this, this disease is seasonal. It shouldn't be here. We're in the middle of summer. Uh, and again, this idea that we've assigned seasonality to a virus, we assign these values to the virus that were never proven scientifically. Um, we need to recommit ourselves to the basic measures. We need to decide that this disease stops with me. Individuals need to protect, uh, let the disease stop with them. Communities need to ensure that the disease stops with them in clusters. Governments need to support communities and individuals to do that. And I've said it before. We're expecting our communities to do extraordinary things, to separate themselves in extraordinary ways, to make huge sacrifices. In order for that to be successful, governments need to support communities in extraordinary ways. Um, and within all of this, uh, all of us, none of us, are doing enough to make this all work. Everyone's got to recommit themselves and increase the level of commitment. We're all working hard. Everyone's working hard. We're just not working hard enough. Bruce. Thank you, Mike, and, and thanks for the question. Um, we do have efficient vaccines, but... Sorry. Remember, we're in a situation with an escalating virus right now. We have, in terms of numbers and transmission in many parts of the world, we have a virus that is also evolving. And we have, against that background, as Mike said, a decreasing what we call stringency in the application of the measures that we have. The, and when you put those three things together, you're making it easier for the virus, and the virus is taking off. So things can get worse. Numbers can go up. And we're seeing that. Against that, we have vaccines, yes, but we have limited supplies of vaccines that will be rolled out uh, slowly across the world. And we also have, you know, vaccines are not perfect. They don't protect everyone against in, in, in every situation, as you know. So as a result, the situation could definitely get worse in the short term. And we also have hesitancy against the vaccines in places. So it is not the silver bullet, as the Director General has reaffirmed and Mike multiple times. But there's very good news, of course, because now we have three lines of defense, but we have to use them all. The first line of defense we're starting to roll out is the vaccine that can protect people from getting infected. And then we have diagnostics, and we have new rapid diagnostics that work well. They give a second line of defense so you can find the ones who get infected. You can rapidly isolate, rapidly quarantine. And then we have the third line of defense. For those people who are infected and get sick, we have dexamethasone, oxygen, as Maria lays out all the time, very, very good clinical pathways, and you can save lives if all of that is applied. But no one part of this works. You have to use all three lines of defense, or the situation will continue to be very bad. And that middle line of defense is still about finding cases, getting them uh, isolated very rapidly. Not just hospitalized, but the mild and moderate cases at home. We have to make it easier for people to isolate so that they don't infect other people. You need all of that. Vaccine is such an important part of the solution. But this is a complex situation, and we need all pieces of this working together. Thank you. Maria? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to highlight the, the point you made about the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, um, but that tunnel is a long tunnel right now, and it's dark and it's dangerous and it's a challenging one that we have to get through. But we have the tools to help us get through that, and more and more and more are coming online. But please don't forget about the tools we have in hand. We're all in a challenging situation. We're tired. 
we're frustrated, we want this to be done, um, but we have to be part of the collective action towards ending this. We have to be part of the, collection, uh, the collective action to prevent ourselves from getting infected, and if we do get infected, the virus stops with us. We don't allow this virus to pass from us to someone else. And we have the tools in hand to do that. Whether this is related to a virus variant, these variants will be detected, and it's confusing and it's scary, but the virus itself is enough to scare us into action. We need individual information to turn into action. We need knowledge to turn into action. We need intent to turn into action. And all of us have a role to play. But it's not just up to individual level measures. We need our families. We need our communities. We need governments to provide supportive environments in which we can take those actions. We need not only good testing um, with rapid turnaround results. We need those tests to link to public health action so that we know where the virus is circulating. We know if, if I'm infected or if I'm a contact of someone who's been infected, I need to know what to do, and I need to know that I will be supported in being in quarantine and that I can protect my loved ones. We have a very different situation around the world. Many countries have shown us the hope that by doing all of this collective action, by putting in the hard work through a comprehensive strategy, not one measure alone, many measures together, applying them in a comprehensive way with strong national plans, implemented, adapted, agile at the local levels, tailoring it to the specific needs of the local level. They've shown us the way. We have outlined guidance and support of all of our member states and support of everyone everywhere about what needs to be done, and we know it's hard. But we have seen, we have it demonstrated over and over again that it works. So this is why we sit up here and repeat that there are many things that we can do. Vaccines and vaccinations are another tool that will help us get to that light at that end of the tunnel but it will take time. So there's a frustration, and I understand that, and all of us understand that because we, we, we feel it too, um, but it will take some time. But let's, let's look at the hopeful angle here and that we are lucky in the sense that we do have tools. We need to make sure that that luck and that hard work and these um, vaccines reach all people all over the world and the COVAX facility and the commitments that we have seen across the world to make sure that that turns from not just words, but into action, um, becomes a reality. Um, so there's a lot that we can do. So I just wanted to highlight your, your light at the end of the tunnel. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and everyone that's listening to us today needs to know that there's something they can do. They need to feel empowered. And if you don't know what it is you can do, come to our website or come or reach out to find out how can I help, because all of us can be part of the solution to a very challenging situation that all of us are in together. Thank you. Um, I would like now to invite Tony Waterman from Asia News Channel to ask the, uh, the next question. Tony? Thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, it's just on the uh, WHO team of experts that has now arrived in Wuhan. Um, I believe the video meetings began today with Chinese counterparts. I'm just wondering if there's any update on these initial meetings uh, or if you could provide any more specific information about what sort of cooperation um, is going to be carried out and how the uh, potential identification of patient zero in Italy from November will sort of play into this investigation into the origins of the, uh, of the pandemic. Thank you. Dr. Ryan? Uh, yeah, the, the team did immediately begin work and, uh, and uh, will be uh, working with Chinese counterparts to implement the terms of reference as we've agreed and getting more specific on the specific uh, data and the studies uh, that, we, that we want to see and the, the follow-up studies that need to be carried out. But uh, I wouldn't... At this stage, I think it's very important that the team are going to have uh, the need to be able to engage with their scientific counterparts in China. We, we, we can't uh, debate this every day. What do they do today, tomorrow? What do they do the next day? They have to have the space to be able to do the work. Um, and therefore, uh, Maria can outline in more detail 
the, the overview of what we want to achieve. But uh, this can't be paced on a daily basis and, 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 and litigated on, in, in press conferences. I'm sorry, because this is not the way we would do outbreak response or outbreak investigation or origins investigation in any situation. However, uh, our team will be in touch with the media in the field. There will be regular briefings, and I'm sure that uh, we will be able to keep you updated on the day-to-day -day activities. But uh, forgive me for, for not getting into the detail of what the team is achieving on a daily basis. Thanks. I'm not going to give you any, any, any very uh, detailed response either because, as Mike said, the team needs to do the work. So the, the Chinese counterparts and the international team have been meeting regularly and been talking by teleconference. And now that the team is in Wuhan, they're going through their quarantine period, but they're meeting again by um, video conference. Um, once they finish that quarantine period, they'll be able to meet face to face. And anyone who's ever been involved in you know, visiting the field or in these outbreak types investigations, you know, these studies take time. Um, mainly what will happen is a series of studies. Um, and these series of studies have already begun, looking at some of these initial patients uh, from December um, and epidemiologic studies, seroepidemiologic studies, studies and review of, of um, past work that had happened in the markets that have happened um, with patients. So it's a, number, it's a number of things. But we won't be giving a day-by-day -day update of, of what the team is doing. Um, what we do need to do is let them do the work uh, and carry that out and put um, the information that all of them are learning together into context and planning the next series of studies. Um, you mention a, a report from Italy um, and you refer to this person as patient zero. We need to be very careful about the use of the, the phrase patient zero, which many people indicate as the first initial case. Uh, we, never, we may never find who the patient zero was. What we need to do is follow the science. We need to follow the studies and make sure that they are done comprehensively. Um, any report of cases uh, that were detected uh, through either looking at clinical samples, stored clinical samples, or uh, stored sera uh, into 2019, we are following up on. Um, we, are, we are reaching out through our global networks, contacting the researchers directly uh, to find out more information and set up collaborations for potential further work of any samples or studies uh, that, that uh, remain. So we will continue to follow that and we will report um, as, as much as we learn when we learn um, to you. Um, but it will be put in a collective uh, understanding of the science. So um, yes, yeah, so the team is there. They're very happy to be there. They're very happy to be working with their Chinese counterparts. Um, and we're thrilled for them to be able to, to have this time. But Bruce and I spent some time in, in China, and we are grateful for the opportunity to have worked directly, you know, scientist to scientist, um, to be able to have that level of interaction. So let's let them do the work, let's let them follow the science, um, and we will report uh, when we can. Fidel, can I just follow up again? Because I, I think it's important. The, the Director General and his mission to China in January 2020, uh, as early as that and before that in terms of the, the various meetings here. The issue of the origin of the virus and the animal-human interface was on the agenda. Uh, uh, the mission to China in February, the animal-human interface and the origin of the virus was on the agenda. The, the World Health Assembly in May uh, formulated a resolution asking the Director General to deploy a team uh, to follow up on that issue of designing studies that would allow us to reach uh, some better knowledge on this. Uh, a team was deployed in June, July that went to the field to do that preliminary uh, discussion with Chinese colleagues on the ground. Uh, subsequently, we've been planning that mission. That mission has now been deployed and has arrived in Wuhan. That mission has 10 of the finest scientists I've ever worked with on it from different countries around the world covering a huge range of skills supported by uh, WHO team and in the context of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network uh, support. The global scientific community has to come together in a network with GORN at the request of the Director General to deploy a team to work with Chinese counterparts to find the scientific answers we need so we can learn more about the origin of this virus. Uh, they are in Wuhan today. I think we do need to give them the time and the space to do that work. We do thank uh, our colleagues in China for working with us to achieve this. These things are not always easy to achieve, 
and we do thank them for that. We thank the colleagues, our colleagues in Singapore for facilitating the transit of our team and all of those who are working so hard to ensure that we get, all get, the scientific answers that we need so we can protect public health uh, now and into the future. So uh, in that regard, we should see today as the culmination of, of a lot of work to put together this process. And as Maria said, there are no guarantees of answers. We've seen the same in previous epidemics of emerging diseases. It is a difficult task to fully establish the origins, and sometimes it can take two or three or four uh, attempts to be able to do that in different settings. So uh, I do hope that I wish the mission luck in the field. Uh, they're a wonderful uh, group of people, and we trust uh, with, the, the, with the cooperation and the hospitality of the Chinese government, the Chinese people, and the authorities in Hubei and Wuhan, we will have a successful mission. Thank you both. I would like now to invite Jamie Keaton from Associated Press to ask the next question. Jamie? Thank you, Fidela. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, please. Happy New Year to you all. Um, it's nice to see you again. And I'd just like to say that I, I think that I speak for much of the Geneva Press Corps in saying that I hope that we'll also see WHO um, spokespeople return to the UN briefings here. Um, my question is for Dr. Houssin. Um, I'd just like to um, thank you for your recommendations. They're very illuminating. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, the recently announced travel bans that have, we've seen in places like, um, the, in like uh, the UK or in other places, uh, particularly with travelers coming from South Africa or, or the UK in particular. Um, you mentioned in your recommendations um, that countries should apply evidence-based approaches with regard to international travel. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit on that and just could you help us understand if, in your view, these bans on travel are justified by the science? Thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Professor Usa. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Keaton. Um, well, this is not a, an easy question because we tend to, to live uh, with, of course, the lessons from the past with regard to travel in the context of the international health regulations. But uh, with uh, coronavirus, things have changed. And uh, it's necessary to reconsider perhaps some of the uh, orientations which were uh, commonplace in the context of, uh, of the IHR. And this is where science-based can perhaps modify some, some attitude. At the moment, what we see is that there is, some, uh, there is a great uh, disparity in the behavior of the member states uh, about uh, uh, testing, about quarantine, about bans, about visa, uh, suppression of visa, etc. And this is why we, are not, we, we didn't go into the details of what should be done. But our recommendation to WHO was that it was really time to reassess uh, what could, could be recommended, what guidance could be provided with regard to air travel, sea travel, land borders, considering the new scientific uh, information provided with the uh, coronavirus. This is our recommendation. Of course, I cannot give you a precise response about what should be recommended, but the recommendation was really to put a, a strong focus on this difficult uh, topic, which may uh, lead us to see things a bit differently from uh, the previous years, for example, at the time of uh, uh, H1N1 uh, influenza pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Usain. I would like now to give the floor to Dr. Carmen Dolea, Unit Head EHR, to complement the answer. Dr. Dolea, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Fadela, and thank you very much for the question. And uh, to complement what uh, uh, Professor Hussein said, the chair of the uh, emergency committee, we welcome the um, continued uh, advice and recommendations from the emergency committee that uh, build on the current uh, work that we, are, uh, we have been doing. And um, just to uh, uh, let you know that we have published uh, recently an updated guidance on, uh, on considerations for um, uh, implementing uh, um, travel-related uh, measures to um, address uh, transmission um, of COVID-19, uh, transmission of SARS-CoV, 
uh, in the international context. And this guidance is uh, promoting a risk uh, management approach for countries whereby they take into account when they issue the measures um, a number of elements that uh, um, can influence the uh, suppression and the risk of, of transmission um, via travel um, um, of the disease. So we propose that in, in this guidance, uh, there are basic approaches that continue to be done in terms of um, um, self-monitoring uh, travel advice. There are also additional approaches that can be done based on an assessment of, of the risk in uh, arriving country, of the capacities of destination countries and uh, of uh, the health system um, um, surveillance and, uh, and response. And these approaches, will we will continue to refine these guidance and approaches based on what we begin to learn from countries on the effect of these measures on actually suppressing um, or influencing the transmission um, of, uh, of the disease at the international level. Um, the, the recommendations of the, uh, again, the, the review committee will continue to work with partners in the aviation and, and transportation sector to um, calibrate better the measures and the advice that we give on countries based on the um, assessment and the evidence that these measures uh, can have on reducing uh, um, international uh, spread of the disease. I hope this answers the question. I don't know if Mike can supplement. Uh, uh, hi, Jamie, and, and Happy New Year to you as well. Uh, maybe let me give you one example, because you, you, you're asking specifically about the science-based approach. And as Mer and Carmen has outlined quite correctly, a risk management-based approach. If you look at the recommendation made by the committee around vaccination for travelers, it says at the present time that, we, that the committee does not recommend to include a requirement of proof of vaccination for international travel. Not because that won't be a good idea in future but because we are lacking critical evidence regarding whether or not persons who are vaccinated could, continue to, could be infected or continue to transmit disease. And because nobody in the world beyond health workers and very vulnerable people have access to the vaccine. The committee is not saying don't. What the committee is saying is at this present time, scientific evidence is not complete. There isn't enough vaccine, and therefore we shouldn't do that now and create an unnecessary restriction to travel, a barrier to travel that's artificial uh, until such a time as we have the evidence and the vaccine. And I think that's the way the committee has approached things. This is about uh, taking the principles of science and precaution, using the best evidence one has, using a risk management approach, and we appreciate the recommendations of the committee at this time. Uh, but that will change over time and there may be different reasons in future to do that. So we're trying to protect the travel space uh, and ensure that economies are not entirely isolated but recognizing that a small island nation is very different to a nation that's landlocked in the middle of a continent. The consequences economically and socially of preventing or stopping travel are different for each individual family, community and country. It can only be made as a decision at that level. There are attempts and very laudable attempts amongst economic integration organizations like the European Union to try and harmonize the rules around travel. I think that's a very positive thing and we should encourage that. Taking a regional and sub-regional risk management approach is a very positive thing. But we have to re recognize that it is very difficult to legislate risk management measures at a global level that cover all types of travel in every situation between every country because circumstances change. So therefore, taking this risk management approach, applying science as best we can, and working within and between governments to ensure that we align those measures in the best possible way, we believe is the best way forward. So we do thank the committee for their careful recommendations related to travel and, and all of the other matters. Thanks. I just want to come in on the first part of your comment, uh, Jamie, around the, the UN press briefings. Um, I just wanted to say I, for one, am very proud to sit up here next to Dr. Tedros, Dr. Ryan, and so many other amazing uh, colleagues here at WHO. Um, my first press conference for this pandemic was about a year ago, uh, as of yesterday. Uh, and as of today, we've done more than 130 press conferences. Uh, we've done more than 50 live Q&As uh, where we answer direct questions. Our press conferences are translated by amazing translators who are sitting in the room and I, I note I try to speak more slowly for them as they try to translate our answers to you 
uh, six different UN languages plus Hindi plus Portuguese and we have live um, uh, captions that are ongoing as well. Um, it's a privilege for us to do these briefings, to be able to answer these questions to all of you, to journalists, uh, to people in the general communities. We will continue to do so um, because these are important ways in which, one of the ways in which we get information out. Um, so thanks for, for mentioning that. Um, we will continue to find different ways in which we can, can communicate, but I for one am very proud uh, to sit up here um, with this amazing uh, group of individuals uh, day in and day out. Thank you. I would like now to invite uh, Brazilian journalist Bianca Rothier from Global to ask the next question. Bianca. Bianca. Can you unmute yourself, please? Bianca, can you hear me? You are, mu you are muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Uh, if not, I will uh, move on to ask Sophie Mokwena from SABC South Africa to ask the next question. Sophie, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Um, the Director General spoke about a need for uh, ensuring that all countries, we see these visuals where uh, the frontline workers and the vulnerable people are receiving the vaccine. But it looks like it's doom and gloom to a continent like Africa. Um, unless the wealthy nations, particularly the G20, they are conscious, tells them that, uh, as you often say, Director General, uh, no one is free until all of us, we, no one is safe until all of us we are safe. It looks like there's no movement from the particularly G7 and the G20 to really invest in COVAX. And perhaps with the new incoming president of the United States of America, Joe Biden, next week, are you hopeful, as he has indicated, that uh, his priority will be to rejoin the World Health Organization, that uh, perhaps world leaders with America back on board Thank will see a different Thank approach? Thank you, Sophie. Um, well understood. I would like to invite Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Swami Nathan, to, to answer your question. Thank you, Sophie, for that uh, very important uh, question. And this is exactly what the Director General and the WHO have been saying uh, from the beginning. It's a question of solidarity, finding solutions, and then sharing them uh, equitably. So science has played a major role in the last year. We've had amazing progress in diagnostics, uh, in a lot of clinical trials for drugs and, and, of course, for vaccines in a position where today, a year after the discovery of a new virus, we have not one, but we have several vaccines uh, that are in development, several that have been approved in certain countries and deployed. One, of course, that has WHO emergency use listing. But just, uh, I was looking at the landscape document that we have on our website and there are over 170 candidates still in preclinical development and 65 in clinical development, 15 of them in phase three clinical trials. So th that gives a lot of hope. There are more to tools, more vaccines coming down uh, the pipeline. In, a, in April, the Director General, along with many leaders around the world and, and several global health agencies, set up the ACT Accelerator exactly to address the issue of how to accelerate the development of tools, but equally, if not more important, how to ensure equitable access. So from the very beginning, we have recognized and advocated for equitable access, and the COVAX facility, which WHO uh, runs jointly with Gavi and CEPI, was set up to ensure equitable access. And as of now, we do have uh, a guarantee of at least 2 billion doses, but perhaps 
a lot more than that uh, at the moment by the end of 2021. And that's going to go to the 190 countries that have signed up for COVAX. 92 of these are what we call the AMC countries. They're the countries that are eligible for distribution um, of vaccines at uh, either no cost or very low cost by, by Gavi. Um, and we anticipate that the first tranches of vaccines will start going out in the first quarter of this year, even though they may be in small volume, because we also need to recognize that vaccines do need to go through the stages of testing. They need to complete trials. They need to have data on efficacy and safety. They need to be manufactured in a quality assured uh, facility. Dr. Simao's team has been working hard with a number of manufacturers around the world, anticipating results from the trials, already preparing for the regulatory processes and the approvals that need to be put in place. We have at least 13 manufacturers who have expressed an interest and in five of them currently in conversation with WHO. But these things take time. We cannot rush the uh, elements that need to be fulfilled because billions of people are going to receive vaccines. So on the one hand, we have to make sure that the vaccines that we deploy are safe and efficacious and quality assured. And on the other hand, of course, countries are preparing to deploy this. And we, WHO, UNICEF, partners, the World Bank have been working closely with countries. We had a goal of 100 countries to be ready for, for deployment, and that's, that's been done by intense work over the last uh, several months. So we have to wait now for the supplies to get ramped up, to start coming into the facility. We're very hopeful that that's going to start happening very soon. As I mentioned, several vaccines are currently under assessment by our regulatory team. And so in the second and third quarters of this year is when we're really going to start seeing volumes. But I think people should continue to be hopeful. Vaccines are going to arrive in countries. People are going to get vaccinated, starting with the most at risk groups, as Dr. Tedros said, all healthcare workers to start getting vaccines in the next 100 days, and that's the goal, and that's what we are going to get to. Thanks. Bruce might want to add, or maybe Angela. My compliment. I think this is a great question, and, in, and it's a, really a moral issue at this stage we live in, you know, because uh, I think in an ideal world, we would be seeing a different scenario. Right? We would be seeing a scenario where we're understanding that we are living through a global crisis and that we need, no one's safe until everyone is safe. I, in an ideal world, we would not be seeing what we are seeing right now. You know, and WHO worked and partners worked days and days and days to ensure that we put a framework in place that would allow for a timely uh, access to all countries, independent on welcome, on income or, or, or um, uh, availability of resources, right? But the world we live in is not a fair world, right? Uh, and I'm saying this because the COVAX facility is a way to us, for us to reach fairness, you know, and we are going to get there. And we have, uh, like Dr. Sumia was saying, we, there are vaccines that are friendlier to the low and middle income countries' environment, the logistics that are needed to ensure coverage and to ensure that the, the countries can actually use the vaccine to in the priority populations and so on. These vaccines are on the way. You know? So we, what we have is a, a gap in time, right? When we have the, some, now I think it's 46, uh, countries have started vaccinations, and out of these, I think 38 are high-income countries. COVAX facility is there to ensure we can correct the course and make sure that all countries have access to safe and effective vaccines. This is not happening now in January, but it's happening quite soon, and we hope to have good news for you on this in February this year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Simao. I would like to make a second attempt to reach uh, uh, Bianca Rothier from uh, Globo. Uh, Bianca? Hi, Fadela. Can you hear me? Now, very well. Go ahead, please. My apologies. I had a technical problem here. Thanks a lot for trying again. My question is about uh, Brazil. As uh, UK suspended new arrivals from Brazil, over fears of a new coronavirus variant that was detected in Japan from 
travelers from Amazonas, the, the uh, Brazil's largest state, um, because in the same state, in Amazonas, hospitals are overwhelmed, collapsing. We, we have reports of patients dying of suffocation without oxy oxygen. So uh, the state made uh, an urgent call for help from abo abroad. Is WHO aware and prepared to help? Does WHO believe that the new variant could be helping to these sharp highs in cases there? And what do you know about this new variant? Uh, is it more contagious as the UK variant, for example? Uh, it seems a lot of questions, but they are all related. Th thank you, Bianca. Very well understood. I would like uh, to ask Dr. Ryan. Hi, hi Bianca. Yes, uh, we uh, just uh, a lot of questions in there. Uh, yes, we do have a WHO team on the ground in Manas. Uh, and we have been working very closely with state level and federal level authorities over the last number of months. Our regional emergency director, Ciro Agarte, our incident manager, Sylvan Aldegheri, our, uh, our country representative and others uh, are, are, are working very, very closely with our colleagues in Brazil at federal and state level. Uh, you are correct, the situation in, in Amazonas and particularly in Manaus has uh, deteriorated uh, significantly over the last uh, couple of weeks, but that's not the only area. Other areas in, associate with, in association with the Amazon uh, 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 have had uh, uh, big problems in terms of their ICU capacity, Rondonia, uh, MAPA, uh, very high rates of positivity, and in, in this case 30, 54 and 46 percent respectively. So this isn't just an issue in Amazonas, it's not just an issue in Manaus. This is an issue in many areas of Brazil uh, and in many countries in Central and South America. Again, a bit like uh, some of the countries in Europe, uh, like my own, the, 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 the holiday period has probably resulted in many people mixing in a way they haven't mixed before. Uh, and certainly uh, this is not the winter period in these parts of the world, so that's not the factor driving things. Uh, and it remains to be seen to what extent variants are, are driving uh, that disease, and Maria will speak to that in a minute. There has been a rapid case of hospitalizations reported in Amazonas since uh, the middle of December. Most of those cases are in Manaus, the capital of the state, um, but they're increasing in other municipalities as well. Uh, and clearly, if this continues, we're going to see a wave that was greater than what was a catastrophic wave in April and May in Amazonas, and particularly in Manaus, which is a tragedy in itself. The ICU occupancy right now in Manaus is 100% over the full last two weeks. This is a health system under extreme pressure. More than 4,000 new COVID-19 cases uh, and 50 confirmed COVID-19 deaths per day have been reported. Over 2,000 people hospitalized, both suspect and confirmed. Uh, and over uh, 400 people waiting to be hospitalized with, who already have COVID. Um, there are many, many responses going on. The local response team, uh, the incident management team, and, and many others are doing all that they can to continue support. But you are correct. There is a shortage in supply of oxygen. There's a shortage in gloves and basic PPE. Uh, and there's difficulty in transporting oxygen from other states into Manaus. But oxygen is not an easy thing to transport. It's heavy. It's in, usually in these uh, big cylinders. They're, they're weighty. Um, and I'm sure other states and the federal government will come to the assistance uh, of Amazonas and Manaus. Uh, Brazil is a, is, is a country of great solidarity. And, and I think we will see that happen. Uh, another problem, and this is one thing that happens, we've seen before health workers being infected, frontline health workers, of note here is that many, many surveillance officers are now uh, affected by COVID-19. Uh, uh, many of the laboratory staff have been affected through community transmission. And this is a situation where your whole system begins to implode because your hospital system, your public health system, your laboratory system, those people are part of the community themselves and they begin to become infected and the whole, you go into a negative uh, spiral. There's over, uh, I think, a backlog of, uh, of, of 7,000 or more samples. Now, this is not a situation that other places didn't face. I, what I've described there could have been described from New York or northern Italy or any number of places on this planet over the last year. The issue now is how do we get the necessary support, uh, both within and outside Brazil, to support. But this is not just, a, if you look at the epidemic curves, and as I said, in Paraguay and Uruguay and Chile, 
uh, and in Argentina. The whole southern cone uh, all, and all the way up to the Mercosur countries in Central America as well. We've seen a rapid, rapid uh, exponential increase in cases in a number of countries in the Americas. Again, likely driven, as the DG said in his speech, that breaking down of basic behaviour, the increased social mixing, the reduction in physical distancing, fatigue uh, and exhaustion uh, with having to, to manage those measures uh, is driving this. And we're going into waves where, as you can see in the case of Benaus, the hospital and health system has already been weakened by previous waves and therefore harder for them to suffer a second, third punch. So the situation is, is difficult. Um, and in this case, uh, in the case of the southern corner of Central and South America, it is not new variants driving this transmission. New variants may have an impact down the line, and they may be having some impact now, and Maria can speak to what we know about that. Uh, but again, it, it's too easy to just lay the blame on the variant and say it's the virus that did it. Well, unfortunately, it's also what we didn't do that did it. Um, and we have to be able to accept our share individually and as communities, as governments, our share of the responsibility in this virus getting out of control, while recognizing the variants in the virus make it difficult. I've said it before. The opposition has put substitutes on the field. It has more energy. It is, the, the virus has been energized by the ability to evolve and become better and fitter and better adapted to infecting us. We have got to get more efficient at fighting the virus. There are no easy or other answers. Uh, Maria, you might want to speak to, and again, we, our solidarity is with the government and the people of Brazil. Uh, it's entering, obviously, with other countries in the Americas, a very difficult phase. We will, as an organization, as always, do everything to support our member states and everything to support the people of Brazil. Maria. Thanks, Mike. So just uh, some comments on the virus variants um, that are being reported. Um, so there are some virus variants that have been reported from, from Brazil, and we're working directly with researchers and scientists and, and amazing public health professionals in Brazil. Um, they have very strong scientific work uh, sequencing capacities, and um, as Mike said, we met with our colleagues in Pajo today to get an overview of the, of the current situation. Um, with regards to the virus variants, um, there is a, a virus variant um, that has been reported. They're delineating this, the P1 lineage. Um, I won't go into many different names, but just to say there are several um, in Brazil, but also in other countries. Um, this mutation, uh, this variant has several mutations um, that have some known biological importance, you know, the ones you've heard us talk about before, this 501Y mutation and the E484K mutation. I think what we should do, uh, Fidel, is we should plan a, a specific live Q&A on these so that we can get into the details of this and go point by point because it's a lot to cover in a very short answer. Um, but just to say that WHO and partners um, have been monitoring these mutations, so specific changes, one, one change, or variants, which are a collection of mutations and deletions, um, and setting up a monitoring framework to evaluate these mutations, variants of interest and variants of concern. Um, we presented this um, to our strategic advisory group. We've presented this to the R&D um, our R&D uh, forum for, for epidemics. We had an excellent meeting on Tuesday. I think it was Tuesday this week, Tuesday, um, where we uh, developed a research agenda specifically related to the studies that are necessary to better understand each of these virus variants that are being reported, because more and more will be reported. Um, there's pressure on this virus to change. The more it circulates, the more opportunities it has to change. So while we are trying to get transmission under control, we still have to monitor for new variants. We presented this also to the Emergency Committee, this risk monitoring framework uh, that we have outlined, um, where we are working to increase surveillance for the SARS-CoV-2 virus circulation using PCR tests, using antigen-based tests, increasing capacity for sequencing, um, and there are a number of efforts um, that are ongoing around the world to increase sequencing capacity. There's an excellent network across PAHO um, to try to leverage existing systems. Uh, there's, a, there's a system across Africa as well, um, and we're looking at different ways in which we can enhance um, sequencing capacity around the world so that we can detect changes in the virus. We're also working with our virus evolution working group 
which you've heard me mention many times, to set up a risk assessment framework to say, okay, we see something of interest, what does this mean? What are the studies that are needed to evaluate transmission, severity, uh, neutralization, and any potential impact on diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines? Those that are available and those that will be future will be available in the future. We had the R&D research meeting this week to outline the suite of studies that are needed to be conducted, and we're setting up the collaborations to ensure that our partners that work in labs with good biosafety and biosecurity can carry out the research that is needed to answer these questions. And lastly, to make sure that all of this fits into a risk assessment that WHO uh, carries out regularly. We call these our rapid risk assessments. Um, just so that we can put into context what these variants mean. It's a lot of information for me to give in an answer, but I, I provide this because it's not just as simple to say we've identified a mutation. There needs to be a system in place to, to understand what each of these mutations mean, what these variants mean, and how it impacts the behavior of the virus. But as you've heard us say, this virus is dangerous on its own, variant or not. And even if it can provide increased transmissibility, and some of them do, we still have tools that could break chains of transmission. The interventions that have been outlined by WHO that many countries are using, implementing at a local level based on the local situation, um, work at breaking chains of transmission. Um, variants and, and the detection of variants and the emergence of variants makes it harder. Um, but we still have some control over this virus. So um, the emergency committee uh, reinforced uh, what we suggested in terms of monitoring this on a global level um, and, and said that this needs to be strengthened. Um, and so we will work very hard to strengthen that uh, monitoring framework so that we have better eyes and ears on where these virus variants are. And we will also be working on a nomenclature so that we will be able to describe these more eloquently um, to you as they emerge. So it's a work in progress. Um, there's a lot to do, but we all have to do as much as we can to prevent as many infections as we can and reduce the pressure on this virus. Thank you, Dr. Simao. I have a very short intervention because I think what's happening in Manaus and Brazil is actually an alert for many countries, right? Because we, you have a breakdown, you have a resurgence, but at the same time you have a, a enormous breakdown on the health system, the structure. And what we are seeing, we are seeing this, as Mike has mentioned, also in developed countries. So it's not just a matter of a poor resource settings, right? Manaus had an infrastructure that was put in place for the emergency situation, the, the horrible, horrific situation we went through in the first semester last year. And because, because of a false sense of security, it, this was let down, and I think this is an, an, an important alert to all countries. Don't let a false sense of security bring your guard down. If you had built up infrastructure to ICU beds and oxygen distribution points, if you had put that up, don't shut it down. Don't shut it down because it's not over yet. I think we need to learn from what's happening, uh, the terrible situation that Manaus is facing right now. It, it, it's, let's say, that we can prevent further damage if we take this message forward and we take it strongly. Don't let your guard down. We're not down. We're not over yet. Uh, thank you all for your uh, participation. Um, I would like now to invite uh, Dr. Tedros for his final uh, words and also asking if Dr. Hussain has any final comments to make, please do. Um, Dr. Hussain, do you have any final comments? No, thank you very much, except to, to, to reinforce what said uh, Mike Ryan, work, speed, and realism as, are what is necessary at the present time. Uh, thank you, Professor Usa. Uh, over to you, Dr. Tedros. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fadila. And thank you to those journalists who have joined us uh, today. And uh, bon weekend. Thank you. Until we see you in our next presser.
Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, reminding you that you will receive the uh, audio file and Dr. Tedros' uh, opening remarks right after this press conference. The full transcript will be posted on the WHO website as of tomorrow. Uh, thank you and have a nice weekend.